This is Kelly Garney, childhood friend of Randy Rhodes and co-founder of Quiet Riot. And you are watching DC's Daily Dose of Rock Music History. Hey guys, I'm DC Critter and host of Barside Jive. I'd like to welcome you to my daily dose of rock music history. Today is Friday, March 27th, 2020. You have joined me on my COVID-19 shelter-in-place extreme isolation tour, day four. Remember, you can check out my Daily Dose archives as well as all my other content on my YouTube channel. Just search Barside Jive Live. I'm coming at you live from the vocal studios in North Dallas. Now let's talk some rock and roll. On this day in 1952, Sun Records of Memphis, Tennessee began releasing records. The label would later become the home of Elvis Presley, Johnny Cash, Jerry Lee Lewis, and many, many, many others. CBS Laboratories announces the invention of stereophonic records on this day in 1958. Although the new format would be playable on ordinary phonographs, when used on the proper equipment, a new, rich, and fuller sound would be heard. On this day in 1960, two anti-payola bills are introduced in U.S. Congress by 71-year-old Representative Emanuel Seller of New York City. He blames payola for the cacophonous music called rock and roll. That's right, guys, cacophonous. New word for your dictionaries, cacophonous. <laughs> anyway... The cacophonous music called rock and roll and says that style of music would never have gained popularity, especially among teenagers, if not for the result of that dreaded payola. Now here's a not so fun fact. A secret or private payment in return for the promotion of a product, service, etc. through the abuse of one's position, influence, or facilities is the definition of payola. So the bottom line, guys, is DJs would like take under the table money to make sure certain songs were played more. At least that was what's been alleged. I don't know. Could it have happened? Yeah. Did it happen? Probably. Should it have happened? Nah. The very first record ever released by Del Shannon, Runaway, enters the Billboard chart on its way to becoming a million-selling number one hit on this day in 1961. In 2004, in 2004, Rolling Stone rated the song as number 466 on their 500 Greatest Songs of All Time. On this day in 1965, The Who released their first U.S. chart entry, I Can't Explain. Although the song could only climb as high as number 93 on the Billboard Hot 100, the band still gained a large following thanks to their exciting live performances. And exciting they were. Also on this day in 1965, British rocker P.J. Proby, who was accused of splitting his skin-tight trousers during performances on several occasions, was ordered off the stage at a municipal ballroom in Hereford, England. Proby would later claim that the real reason he was fired was to make room for Tom Jones. Roy Orbison fell off a motorbike 
during a UK tour, fracturing his foot on this day in 1966. He played the remaining date sitting on a stool and walking on crutches. On this day in 1967, at a ceremony held at the Playhouse Theater in London, the Beatles were awarded three Ivor Novello Awards, best-selling British single of 1966, Yellow Submarine, most performed song of 1966, Michelle, and next most performed song, Yesterday. On this day in 1971, Three Dog Nights version of Hoyt Axton's Joy to the World enters the Billboard Hot 100 on its way to becoming the biggest selling single of the year. Unlike most Three Dog Nights songs recorded at that point, instead of having just the three main vocalists singing harmony, the song was recorded with all seven members of the band singing. Elvis Presley records what proves to be his last top 10 hit during his lifetime, Burning Love, on this day in 1972. <laughs> <laughs> There's only one, and I hid my mouth. The flames are now licking. <laughs> Drummer Ronnie Tutt would later recall he never felt comfortable with it because he had a hard time with those lyrics. The song would reach number two on the Billboard Hot 100, number one on the Cash Box, bestsellers chart, and number seven in the UK. The song's writer, Dennis Lind, later overdubbed the opening guitar riffs into the record's final mix. <music> on this day in 1973, Jerry Garcia of the Grateful Dead is arrested for speeding on the New Jersey Turnpike, but the $15 speeding ticket turns into $2,000 bail when the police find a wide variety of drugs in Garcia's car. He spends three hours in jail. <music> Eric Clapton married George Harrison's ex-wife, Patty Boyd, in Tucson, Arizona, on this day in 1979. George attended the wedding, as did Ringo and Paul. The newlyweds would stay together for nine years. On this day in 1986, Sammy Hagar plays his first show as lead singer of Van Halen in Shreveport, Louisiana. Many of the over 10,000 people in attendance wore T-shirts or hoisted banners depicting former frontman David Lee Roth's name or photo circled and crossed out. Elton John and Tim Rice win the Oscar for Best Original Song from a motion picture for Can You Feel the Love from The Lion King on this day in 1995. On this day in 1997, Ian Dury, the English rocker who initially rose to fame during the late 1970s as founder and lead singer of the British band Ian Dury and the Blockheads, died of colorectal cancer a few weeks short of his 58th birthday. <music> Former Village People policeman Victor Willis was arrested in San Francisco, California after he disappeared from an ongoing drug and gun trial on this day in 2006. Police had charged Willis with being in possession of cocaine and drug paraphernalia in July of 05. He would later be sentenced to three years probation after he agreed to enter a treatment program.
On this day in 2007, former Jefferson Airplane and Starship singer Grace Slick, along with former manager Bill Thompson, filed a lawsuit in a California federal court charging that another former member, Paul Kantner, violated both trademark rights and an $80,000 legal settlement he signed in 1985 by using the name Paul Kantner's Starship while touring. Gordon Stoker, the tenor voice of the Jordanaires who backed Elvis Presley, Patsy Cline, Jim Reeves, and many more, passed away at the age of 88 on this day in 2013. Estimated sales of records that the vocal group sang on total more than 8 billion copies. On this day in 2015, Willie Nelson announced that he and his family were hard at work on a new brand of marijuana called Willie's Reserve. Stores of that same name were being planned and were to include his signature brand and other strains that are grown to meet quality standards. The Foundation's lead singer, Clem Curtis, died of lung cancer at the age of 76 on this day in 2017. The band is most often remembered for their two biggest hits, Baby Now That I Found You, number 11 in 1968, and Build Me Up, Buttercup, number 3 in 1969. Joe Flannery, an early Beatles booking manager, passed away at the age of 87 on this day in 2019. After Brian Epstein asked him to secure some jobs for his new band, Flannery became close friends with John, Paul, George, and Pete Best, who were regular visitors to his home. He wrote about his experiences in his autobiography, Standing in the Wings, The Beatles, Brian Epstein and Me, published in 2013. And that, kiddies, is rock and roll and wraps my rock history lesson today. But you can wipe away those tears because there is more coming from me to you tomorrow and every day as I peel back the pages of my big-ass book of rock music history and explore the past of the rock legends on my daily dose of rock music. You can catch all of my daily dose episodes as well as all of my content on YouTube. Just search Barside Jive Live. You can also follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Barside Jive. Thanks, guys, for hanging out with me today during my daily dose. Please seek every day to be a hero in someone's life. I will see you very soon. In the meantime, peace, love, and rock and roll. Take it, boner. Have mercy. Good night, Bill. SpartsideJiveLive.com